How many were here last week? Remember those slides of the Honduras pictures? Do you remember that? Did you notice that Jason wasn't in any of the work pictures? <laughs> all that concrete work and all that building construction work, and I didn't see Jason in any of them. So. <laughs> I was privileged to go on a short-term uh, missions trip that Del Kinney uh, took to Honduras. We were serving World Gospel Outreach at the time, and we were up in uh, uh, the mountains at this Rancho Ebenezer, and we were doing some work, plumbing work and building work and construction, and I was assigned to uh, Bill Moore, the plumber. And after about five days, he fired me. And said, go work with the carpenters. They think they might need you. So I went over to the carpenters and, uh, well, why don't you go with the ditch diggers? I think they could use you. So, Jason, yeah, I'm, I'm not much of an outdoor worker either. Uh, right after high school, I spent time um, working for a construction company called Fox and Schnicker uh, Construction Company. Aaron Fox was a member of our church, as was Gary Schnicker. Uh, and so they, they took me on because my dad was one of the elders at the church, and they thought, oh, let's take on the kid. So they took me on after my high school, summer high school years, and I'm there working, plumbing and construction. And I said, you know, this is pretty good money. I think I'll keep working instead of going to college. And then for one more semester, I realized I got to stop. This is terrible. I don't know. What, I still know what a hammer is and pliers and a screwdriver, but I was the gopher. The gopher means go for this, Bob. I want you to go get this. And I say, well, what does it look like? <laughs> and after explaining the tool to me about four or five times, they were frustrated. They wanted to fire me, but they dare not because my dad. And so uh, anyway, I said, I'm going to school. So I went to Bible college. All my friends were going to a Bible college in Florida called Florida Bible College. It was way down south uh, near Hollywood, Florida, which is right uh, south of Fort Lauderdale and north of Miami. And so I suffered for Jesus going to Bible college on the beach. <laughs> Spent one year there, then I transferred to Moody Bible Institute, met my wife Cheryl, and the rest is history. But I'm not a master builder. Master builder? Greg is probably the best on our staff in building things. Greg. So if you need a building project around the church, contact him. If you have any IT work, uh, computer work, contact him. If you need a, just contact Greg. <laughs> We're in a series called uh, The Imperfect Church. How many churches are perfect? None. Randy, you didn't answer. How many are perfect? None. None. No matter what church you go to, if you spend any time in that church, you're going to find faults in that church. There are no perfect churches. And so we're looking at a church called Corinth that Paul wrote a letter to called 1 Corinthians. And I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, please grab one in the seat in front of you. Turn to the back of the Bible, that's the New Testament, and stop at page 131. And you'll find 1 Corinthians 3. The reason Paul is writing this letter is because this church has problems. And the major problem that he addresses right off the bat is division. The problem is that's major in our church is not turning off your cell phone. <laughs> so let's look at chapter 3. Again, this is under the heading of division. This sermon today is really a continuation of last week's sermon, which is the problem of maturity. I'm calling it the problem of building material, which we'll get to in a minute. So follow along as I start reading from verse 1. And I, bre I brethren, he's writing to the church, people, brothers and sisters in Christ, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able. For you are still fleshly, living according to your sinful nature. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men, like the unbeliever? 
and one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul, servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, they're equal. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you, the church, you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on, it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are a temple of God? And that the spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he is wise in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness, And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. So then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All things belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Would you join me in prayer, Lord? We come before you thanking you for what I just read. As we look at this passage dealing with maturity, you're asking us to move from being an infant in Christ to becoming men and women who are spiritually mature. So Lord, direct my thoughts, direct my words. May the scriptures come alive as they're supposed to do because it's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And help us as a body of believers to focus and what your spirit wants to teach us this morning. I pray this in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. In chapter 3, Paul's really pointing out that division is a result of being immature, being an infant in Christ. And he's pushing us to maturity. We need to move from infancy to spiritual maturity. Now, in verses 10 through 23, I want to point out three reasons why you and I have a duty to grow into spiritual men and women. And the first one really is, you are God's building. It's part of the end of verse 9. Paul says about he and Apollos, we're fellow workers. You, meaning the church, you're God's field. That's why he used the word I planted and Apollos watered. He's using agriculture illustration, but now he's turning his attention to building. You are God's building is what he is saying here in verse 9. And then in verses 10 through 15, he talks about this building. See, believers In Corinth, just as believers in Davis, just as believers who meet in churches, they're all part of God's building. Believers are part of God's building. Now, I want you to notice right off the bat in verse 9, it says, you are, you are, that's plural. In English, you can't tell whether you is singular or plural because it's you both ways. So you got to think like a Philadelphia person, you guys, Okay. (laughs) That's what it's saying. You guys are God's building. Plural, collective. 
And in verse 10 and verse 11, he's making four major statements. The first is, Paul laid a foundation. So picture a building. It starts with the foundation being erected and then the building going up from that. And Paul says, I laid the foundation in verse 10. He says, I was like a wise master builder. Write Jason next to that. That'll keep you, now you know what that's like. A wise, a skilled chief builder. Today we would call it the project manager of construction, whatever the project is. He's the project manager of this. Paul says, that, that's what I was. I laid a foundation. Now, he says, I laid it because the grace of God was given to me. It's all by God's grace that gave him the skills and the ability to lay that foundation. Now, what's the foundation? Well, in verse 11, we hear it's Jesus Christ. But I think the foundation that Paul is laying is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go back to chapter 2 for a minute. Paul recounts the first time he came to Corinth preaching the gospel. He says in verse 1, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom. I came proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's why in chapter 1, verse 23, it says we preach Christ crucified. We preach it's all about Jesus Christ, that he went to a cross to pay for sin. Jesus is the foundation. Paul came and laid this foundation of the preaching of Jesus Christ. He then says in verse 10 also, another is building on it. That's probably Apollos who came after him and started teaching the word of God to the people at Corinth. And then the third part he says in verse 10 is, each man who builds on it must be careful. Each man must be careful how he builds on it, the foundation. Because he says in verse 11, there's really only one foundation, and that's what? That's who? Jesus Christ. So of the four statements, the first and the fourth deal with foundation, and the two middle one deals with those who are building on this foundation. And the third part is each man, each person who builds on it must be careful. It's a warning. Remember, in verse 9, this is God's building. God's building. So believers, understand you are part of God's building. And believers must be careful for the way they build. Notice in verses 12 through 15, each of us chooses the material with which to build, with which to build. Look at verse uh, 12. He gives us six elements that we are choosing to build with. If any man builds on a foundation, which is Jesus Christ, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. Now, who in their right minds would say, okay, I'm going to go onto a building project. Get me all the straw you can. No, it, it, your, your work is not, I'm choosing to build with straw. What shows it to be straw, the work that you're doing is when it gets evaluated. But each of us will have material with which to build. And notice it's two different groups. We have one group, gold, silver, and precious stones. And I don't think that means gems like diamonds and rubies. I think the precious stones is out of the ground comes this solid rock, which is precious for building. Wood, hay, straw. That's not so precious material. First three valuable, second three not so valuable. First three kind of good to look at, beautiful to look at. The other three are kind of common. The first three are really durable, has lasting power. The second three really is passing away. It's temporary. It's not going to last. Six different types of material. But notice in verse 13, it tells us that each, each of us will have his or her work evaluated. Each man's work will become evident for the day will show it. The day will show it. There's coming a day when we're going to have our work evaluated. Look on the screen. Here's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Paul says, for we, meaning the believer in Jesus Christ, for we 
must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. How many of us will appear before the judgment seat? Yeah, all of us. So that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. How many of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? All of us. And we're all going to have to give an account of what we have done in this building project of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The day will show it. There's a future day of accounting coming. And the work's going to be revealed by fire. Now, this doesn't mean fire like purgatory. This is meaning an illustration of a building project. Fire would actually test whether or not the building is going to stand. In Paul's culture, when a, a city caught on flame, the whole city was destroyed except for that which was built with rock and gold and silver, like most temples. And so he's using this illustration of fire to say fire tests the quality of the work or the material that is used. And verses 14 and 15 tell us simply that each of us will be judged for our work. There's a day of judgment coming, we're going to be judged. And simply put, if your work remains, you'll be rewarded. If your work is burned up, you will suffer loss. I don't like that idea of suffering loss, do you? Many read suffering loss as, well, you just don't get a reward. That's not what it's saying, right? It doesn't say you don't get rewarded. It means you suffer loss. I still don't like that idea of suffering loss. So what do the, the six materials represent? The gold, silver, and precious stones, and the wood, hay, and the straw. What does it represent? Well, it doesn't tell us what it represents. All it tells us is that like a contrast one has lasting power, the other doesn't have lasting power. One is valuable, the other is not so valuable. So I think this, this is me speaking, not anybody else. I think that which lasts is work that you do for Jesus Christ based on the spirit of God that is in you. It's spirit empowered, it's spirit driven. That will last. That work, when it's done through the spirit, the spiritual gifts that he's given you, is going to be lasting work. Work that's not based on the spirit, but maybe on the world's wisdom of status-seeking, competition to be better than others, or self-promotion. That kind of work for Christ is, that's going to be burned up. But each of us will be judged for our work. There's coming a day when there will be judgment for our work. So the first question I ask you, do you realize you're part of Christ's building? God's building. It's like one of those skyscrapers that is just adding another floor, adding another floor, adding another floor, adding another floor. The foundation is who? Jesus Christ. It starts with the gospel of Jesus Christ, receiving him by faith. When you receive Jesus Christ by faith, you are now part of the building. And you're working on the building. And each one of us is on the building, supposed to be working on the building. So are you working on the building? The second thing I see in the text is a reason why you and I have a duty to grow into spiritual men and women. The second reason is because you are the temple of God. You're a temple of God. Now, this is not the normal word for a temple, meaning the structure of the temple. This is the idea of the sanctuary. That sacred enclosure in the temple in Jerusalem, it would have been the Holy of Holies, the place of God's presence where the Ark of the Lord was. But here it's saying you are a temple, you are a sanctuary. And again, the you are is plural. You guys are the temple of God. Not individual people. It's not referring to you as an individual or a temple because the Holy Spirit is in you. That's what it does say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In fact, look at that on screen. Paul writes, do you not know that your body, this is individual, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. The Spirit is 
given to you from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Here it's talking about you, all of you, but individually that your body, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. But back in 1 Corinthians 3, it's not talking to you individually, it's talking to you as a church, as a collective group. Do you realize when we come together as brothers and sisters of Christ, we are the sanctuary of God. The Holy Spirit is present, not only in you individually, but present here as a sanctuary of God. And this is not a question for the individual believer. This is a question for you collectively. Do you not know that you are a temple of God? Don't you know that? Now, I was writing to the church, and I grew up in, uh, under teaching at Moody Bible Institute and Trinity and different thing called dispensational theology. Anybody ever hear of that term, dispensational theology? Yeah, dispensational means that God has different dispensations with which he works with people. In the Old Testament, that was under the Old Covenant. It was the dispensation of law. God driv drove man to abide by law, do the law that pleased God. Now we're in the dispensation of grace. Grace means that we have God's spirit in us and we live in the age of grace, in the age of the spirit. And so we make a separation between temple and church. The church, the ecclesia, the body of Christ, that's the new dispensation. That's a new covenant idea. But temple, that's the old covenant idea. That's dealing with obeying the law, going to the temple. The only problem with dispensational thinking, and now I grew up with that, and for the most part I hold to that, but sometimes Paul mixes things up, doesn't he? He just got done saying, you are what? He didn't say, you are the church, the body of Christ, and the spirit is within you as a church. He could have said that. No, he calls you a temple. He calls you the sanctuary. Let's look at another place where he mixes it up. Ephesians chapter 2. You don't have to turn there. I'll put it on the screen for you. In verse 19, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he says, so then you, meaning the believer. Now, at the you, really, back in verse 13, it says, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. So you means the one who trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So then verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. By faith in Christ Jesus, you're now part of God's house. Isn't that cool? Not the building, meaning, but the people of God's house. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now he's using the term foundation. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. He's the cornerstone of the foundation. The whole foundation rests on that cornerstone, and Jesus Christ is that cornerstone. So he goes on to say, in whom the whole building, now the metaphor is changed to not just household of people, but now building, and where a whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple. Paul, you're messing up dispensational teaching. You're using too many things, combining them all into one thing, when really what he's saying is, church, you are not only God's building, you're also the temple of God. You're his sanctuary. And in verse 17, he says, you need to take note of this warning. If anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. Jason's learning Greek. He comes to me for help every now and then, and I can't give it to him because I forgot it all. <laughs> but I have a software package that tells me every word that I can look up and say, what kind of Greek word is this? This word for destroy is an old Greek word. It's not the normal one for destruction, destroy. It's an older one, and it's an older Greek word that can mean destroy, but it often means corrupt or to spoil or to ruin. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, he uses the same word by saying, bad company corrupts 
good morals, okay? That word corrupt is the word we have here for destroy. So really when it says when you are destroying the temple, the people, when you, we have the spirit of God here, when you're destroying that, God will destroy you, meaning God will cause corruption to come. He'll ruin you. You want to ruin the temple? He'll ruin you is what it's saying. You want to wreck the temple? He'll wreck you. I don't like the sound of that, do you? Because he's writing to who here? The believer. God's going to wreck you. I don't like that. We have three boys. Our youngest boy was the most compliant. He was a pretty good boy. He's sitting over here. He's embarrassed right now. But I have a middle son. My middle son, from the ages of two to four, he was, well, he got this hand tired. Okay, this was my spanking hand. He got this hand tired. He had built into him a strong sense of pesha. Pesha is a Hebrew word. Greg, uh, Jason hasn't learned Hebrew yet. Pesha, it's the word that you see in scripture called transgression. Transgression really means rebellion. It means you know the right thing, but you choose to do the opposite. That's pesha. Matthew had a lot of pesha. He knew what the right thing is, so I'd say, Matthew, come on, let's go to your bedroom. We go to the bedroom, I'd sit him down, I'd talk to him, I'd say, this is what, you, I didn't use the word pesha, I said, you were rebellious, you did this. Now, we didn't spank for everything, we spanked for rebellion, and we spanked for harm. When you, out of meanness, hurt somebody, you got a spanking. But pesha, you got a spanking. Not just a talking to, you got the spanking. And so I tell him that about the what he did rebellious, why this is wrong, why we don't want him to be like this, and blah, blah, blah. So that's what he thinks, too, when I this, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. So then uh, I get down to it. And I got down to it, and he turns to me as a two-year-old. That didn't hurt. <laughs> don't tell the father that it didn't hurt. Let me tell you here, when it says that you destroy God's temple, he will destroy you, you're not going to come away saying that didn't hurt. I don't know what the ruin's going to be. I don't know what the, um, you know, the wrecking's going to be or the, the term that he's using here for, uh, for that Greek word, but it's not going to be good. And who are the ones who are wrecking the temple? Who are the ones who are spoiling, they're ruining the temple? Well, in this whole section of chapters 1 through 4, it's the ones who are causing division. In verse 3 of chapter 3, it's the one who, because of jealousy, I'm not getting my way in the church. And when you have jealousy, you don't get your way, you cause strife. And that's in verse 3. Strife is quarreling, it's disputing, it's saying... I, it's acting like a two-year-old, the infant in Christ, right? Paul's saying here that God wants you to know that we're the sanctuary. The Holy Spirit is present with us. And when you are wrecking the temple because of division, God's going to wreck you. And why is this so important? Because he goes on to say, for the temple of God is holy. In Leviticus chapter 10, if you're reading through the Bible, that calendar Bible that we have in the commons area, pick up one of those little booklets and start reading through the scriptures. You'll read through the scripture, but Leviticus chapter 10 is coming up. Leviticus is a, a, it's a hard book to get through, but you can get through it. So... Did I just say part of God's word was? <laughs> Delete that, please, from the, the live stream. I forgive, forgive me, live stream people. What I'm saying is Leviticus is a hard book to read through. But you get to Leviticus 10, and Aaron's got four sons. And the two older sons are lighting incense in the tabernacle in the holy place. And the law is very careful what the mixture has to be of this incense. And he says over and over, don't deviate from that. But what these two boys do, they decide to, let's change it up a little bit. Who cares? I'm tired of the old incense. Let's put something better in there. 
And so they made a new batch of different type of incense, and fire came out of the incense pan and devoured them, and they died on the spot. Two of Aaron's four sons died on that spot. And Moses comes to him, and Moses tells him, he says, you know why they died? They did not treat the Lord with holiness. When God's telling you the temple of God, the sanctuary, the church, when we're gathering, you are holy. Don't go about wrecking God's sanctuary by division because God's going to wreck you. So the next time I'm tempted to get involved in something that's divisive in the global church, Maybe somebody posted something on the internet criticizing some other church for the way they're doing ministry or some other pastor for what he does, and I'm thinking, yeah, he should be criticized. The next time I want to get involved in something divisive, I need to read verse 17 again. Anyone who goes about dividing the church, God's going to destroy. I don't like the sound of that. I don't know what the destroy was going to be, but I don't like the sound. And the next time you want to get involved in something divisive, you better read verse 17. Because God's got a high opinion of this group of people here. You are the sanctuary of God. Holy Spirit is here. Why should we grow to spiritual maturity? You got to understand you are God's building. You're to be working on God's building. Secondly, you are the temple of God. And third, you belong to Christ. That's in the very last verse of the chapter. You belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. So let's go backwards a little bit. You belong to Christ, and because you belong to Christ, all things belong to you. Look at verse 21. So let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you. Then in verse 22, there's a list of things, and then at the end of that, all things belong to you. Paul's trying to tell you, because you belong to Christ, how many things belong to you? All things belong to you. So then you go back to verse 18, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived according to what? According to the wisdom of this world. In chapter 1, he's talking about wisdom of the unbeliever. Here in chapter 3, he's talking about the wisdom of a believer. Notice what it says. Let no one deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he is wise, he's talking to the church. Wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. You've got to remember in that culture, Greek culture, people loved wisdom. They loved the philosopher. And so you have people who followed Plato. I, I'm a follower. Of, I'm a disciple of Plato. I'm a disciple of Socrates. I'm a disciple of Aristotle. Well, I'm a disciple of Epicurus. No, I'm of Zeno. You know, you can go on forever. The Greeks had so many philosophers. Well, it got into the church. And the church people were saying, I'm a follower of Paul because Paul was the first evangelist that came to our town and he led me to Jesus Christ and I follow his teaching. And others said, I know I follow Apollos. He's a better speaker. He's a gifted communicator. He opens up the word of God in these fresh ways and I'm a follower of Apollos. I love his teaching. And another says, no, I've really got a Jewish background so I like Cephas or Peter, Simon Peter. And so I like Peter's teachings and I like his writings and I'm a follower of Peter. Peter, do you understand where this is going? That's the world's wisdom. You follow a man. You become a disciple of a man. Who's the foundation? Jesus Christ. We don't follow men. We follow Jesus Christ. It's not about man's wisdom. It's really about the foolishness of the cross because that leads to salvation. And so he says in verse 21, don't boast in men. Don't arrogantly follow after these human leaders as if you're a groupie of this guy. You don't follow them. You know, with these mega churches all across the country, it's easy for us to get enamored with this speaker. 
this preacher, that church. It's wrong thinking. That's the wisdom of the world to be following after a certain teacher. See, the right thinking is recognizing all things belong to you. And notice in the verse here, all things belong to you. He lists those same men. Whether it's Paul or Apollos or Cephas. See, they got to get the right priority with regard to these men. You don't follow them. They are there to serve you. You don't serve them. They serve you. You're not a follower of them. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. But these teachers, these biblical teachers, they aid you in helping you follow. And that's a good thing because all of this belongs to you. In fact, the world belongs to you, life or death, or things present, or even the things that are going to come. All of it belongs to you, and the reason it belongs to you is because you belong to who? Christ. So, yeah, listen to other preachers on the radio. I love listening to Erwin Lutzer. I don't understand half the words he says because his vocabulary is so different from mine, but I still love listening to him. All things belong to you. So what's the word to us as a church? Well, last week, the word to the church was, it's time to grow up. It still applies this week, doesn't it? It's time to grow up. Grow up. Don't be an infant in Christ. Grow up. How do you grow up? Got to keep these three pictures in mind. You belong to who? Christ Jesus. He's the foundation. You belong to Christ. Let me ask you this question. Can others tell that you belong to Christ? I don't mean people in the church. I mean people outside of the church. When you're outside of the church, can others tell that you belong to Christ? He's the one you follow. Can others tell that? And if They can tell what's the evidence that they would give to show that you follow Jesus Christ. See, another reason for us to grow up is because you, collective you, are God's temple. The spirit is in you. So be very careful not to cause division in the church. And thirdly, because you are God's building. The foundation is Jesus Christ. You you can't be in the building. You can't be doing any work on the building until you come to that foundation and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. It starts all with that, right? If you don't come to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you're not even on the building. It starts with Christ. But you're on the building as a believer. And each of you is working on the building Is your work going to be burned up because it really doesn't have any lasting value? Or is your work going to be valuable and have lasting power? And then what is the work you're doing? What kind of work are you doing on the building? How are you letting the Spirit of God control your life in such a way that you're doing some kind of work for Jesus Christ? I want my work to be lasting. Gold, silver, and precious stone. I want it to last. Evaluation day is coming. I want my work to last. I want to be part of the building project where God's building is increasing all the time and I'm part of it. So are you prepared for that day when you have an evaluation day? When you stand before Jesus Christ? Are you ready for that day? You're probably thinking, I don't think I'm doing much building. That's why God's given you the Holy Spirit because that's what repentance is, is recognizing that I got to change direction. I'm not building. I'm not doing anything for Jesus Christ. I live my life for me. Oh, I did receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord so many years back, but really the work of God's Spirit in my life is very minimal. You need to repent. Change direction. Yield yourself to the Spirit's control and let him start to control you so that you do make a difference in this world. You are God's building. 
let's build. Father, we come before you thanking you for Jesus. As we sang in How Great Thou Art, and when I think that God, his son not sparing, sometimes it's hard to take that in. And on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away sin. It all starts with the foundation of Jesus Christ, Lord, and I pray that each person here has received Jesus as their Savior and Lord. But Lord, Paul has made it really clear what he expects of us as believers, that we move to maturity, that we recognize we belong to Jesus, that we, as a group, are the temple, the sanctuary of God, the Holy Spirit is present with us. And that each one of us is part of that building and we're to continue working on that building. So Lord, have your way in us and through us and help us as a church to be actively involved in the work of Jesus Christ, making him known. He's our cornerstone. And it's in his name I pray.